Hello, um, I am Liz Wiseman, and uh, first of all, and Ricky, thanks for joining me to this uh, Hacking HR Summit. I've heard great things that have been happening, and thank you everyone who is joining in. My name is Liz Wiseman, and let me see, what can I tell you about myself? I am a, I live here in California, kind of right in the heart of Silicon Valley, and I am a former executive at Oracle. I worked there 17 years where I led the human resource development function, ran the university there. I left Oracle, started into research, which led me into writing. And uh, I'm the author of three books. Uh, and I'm gonna share a few ideas from those books today, but mostly, um, Enrique invited me to share a few insights on how innovation. How do we unleash creativity and new insights and new thinking and disruption inside of organizations? I'm going to look at this through the talent management lens, some of the kind of maybe one or two HR practices, and then some management and leadership practices that will help us increase the amount of creativity and innovation inside of our organization. Now, I'm gonna do it based on a few principles. Now, the first is based on um, some of the ideas I explore in this book, Multipliers. And, and I think the fundamental idea we're gonna explore here today is that people's best thinking, their most creative ideas, their sharpest thinking, it, it needs to be given, not taken. A lot of organizations try to take it, but I think unleash is a better term. Um, you know, really we find that the very best leaders create an environment where people can offer their best ideas and their best work. And it's not really a taking role, it's more about creating a situation where people can, can give. And, you know, I think most of us know that command and control ways of leadership, they, they don't work very well, they certainly don't um, increase engagement in the workforce, but they become a wet blanket, kind of a killjoy on creativity and innovation. So we're gonna look at how some leaders can end up diminishing that, what we can do to be a little bit more of this multiplier-like leader. I'm not gonna talk about diminishers and multipliers directly, I'm just gonna use a few of those principles, including this idea that most of the diminishing that's happening inside of our organizations, and by diminishing, I mean people having to hold back, play it safe getting locked in status quo, offering only a fraction of your capability while wanting to offer more, that most of the diminishing that's happening in the modern workplace is not coming from the tyrannical diminisher as much as it's coming from the accidental diminisher. The leader who thinks she's creating a creative environment, but actually she's doing the exact opposite. You know, and, and really we're gonna explore this question, do the most innovative leaders end up creating the most innovation around them. We're going to explore some of the reasons why they don't. And then I'm going to uh, borrow some ideas from uh, this book called Rookie Smarts that suggests that sometimes experience can become a hindrance to innovation and that perhaps we do our most innovative work when, when we're new to something. Sometimes just knowing too much, whether it's the contributor or the manager knowing too much, it ends up killing the innovation process. And, you know, in the spirit of this idea of hacking HR, I want to offer six hacks, six un hacks to unlock more innovative thinking in your organization. And of course, because of the concept of hack, I thought we would do this around, I'll offer a little hack, but in the context of something that doesn't work, so I'm calling those kind of hashtag fail, versus something that I think works a lot better, we'll call those hashtag winning. So the first is this idea that drawing on experts doesn't tend to lead to innovation. It might lead to high performance in many cases. It might lead to efficiency in many cases, but it, but it doesn't. Anyone who's heard me talk about um, some of these ideas in Rookie Smarts has probably seen this. And actually, um, Enrique, I know you've turned your camera off and you keep your camera off if you want, but I would love, and I'm surprising Enrique with this, um, I'd love to have you read this paragraph for me. All right, um, drawing on experts, and I have my accent, so it's gonna come out in a, in a fun it's way. It's gonna sound good. Oh my goodness, I didn't, I didn't see that. It doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word appear, the only important thing is that the first and last letter are in the right place. The, what? 
the something can be a total mess and you can still read it without a problem. The uh, RSET, the rest can be a total mess. And I, I was like, the rest can be a total mess and you can still read it without a problem. And Liz is putting me on the spot, by the way. I know, I did. I surprised you with that. I didn't want you to read it in advance, but you did such a great job. I want you to go ahead and keep going and read this. Similarly, your mind, your mind reading that automatically without even thinking about it, your mind, you know, I don't know what the 15 is. Uh, similarly, your mind reading this automatically without even thinking about it. It's so fantastic. You're, similarly, your mind is reading this without right. automatically, without even thinking about it. Like, why is it that Enrique can read this despite the fact that none of these words are spelled right or look right? And this is some fantastic research, or, uh, research by Natalie Wolkover who, who, who focuses on what happens once we recognize patterns. That when we see things that look familiar to us, like I've seen it before, yeah, it looks a little different, but my mind sees this and there's some sort of intellectual muscle memory that kicks in and says, I know what the answer to this is. And it happens when we draw on our expertise, when we draw on experts, we often see half of the problem and we instantly jump to a solution. This is something that just came out of this month's um, Harvard Business Review magazine. And there's an article there that uh, some researchers have looked at cardiologists and how cardiologists, how these physicians respond when they're given evidence that there is a better stent process. And it says, but this, but a new study finds an exception when presented with negative information about a decision they've already made and acted on. More experienced people are likelier than others to stick to their guns rather than pivoting to a better approach. That often when we have expertise, when we're given data, market data, new insights to the contrary, it actually tends to cause us to double down on status quo, that thing that we have already believed. Drawing too heavily on um, expertise can kill innovation, but engaging rookies can end up causing um, sparks of innovation, meaning engaging people when they're at the very bottom of a learning curve, bottom of an S-curve, as my um, colleague Whitney Johnson uh, likes to refer to this disruption process. The research I've done on this, when we look at how people without experience approach the same type of work that people with experience are doing, we find that in many cases they're outperforming the people with experience, but there's two cases where it's pretty clear they do a better job. One, strangely, rookies tend to be faster than people with experience. The best insight I can offer on this is that when we're new to something, we're self-conscious, we're a little nervous, we're, we're cognizant that we don't really have points on the board. We don't have a reputation. And so we move very quickly to a solution to establish our reputation, or we don't know enough to complicate things. So we keep things very simple and we're able to get to some of those milestones faster. So rookies tend to be faster and rookies tend to be more innovative. If you need innovation and speed, you might think of putting a rookie on the job or just adding a rookie, and I don't mean someone who's young, I mean someone who's new to something. It could be someone my age who's just never done it before. Put them on a team. They have this kind of disruptive effect. Now, here's an, uh, uh, an HR hack for this is you can either put a rookie on there or you can help your team get into rookie mode. One of my favorite ways to get yourself or your team into rookie mode is to start a new project by making an I don't know list. And it's not an existential I don't know list like, gee, here's a bunch of things I don't know in the world. It's when it comes to this piece, this piece of work, here are essential things I need to know to do this well that I don't know. It's your learning list. It's a gap list of essential knowledge and knowledge and experience I don't have make that list which focuses your learning and if you want that to even have a greater effect share your list publish your list share it with your colleagues like gee 
I don't know how to do this. So many of the things I've learned how to do recently have started with kind of tweeting out one I literally tweeted out to the world like I don't know how to do this and it's essential that I do and I learned from so many wonderful people who taught me how to do those things so number one HR hack make an I don't know list to get yourself into that rookie state of mind number two managers think that if they want creativity they want an innovative creative environment that their job is to get that party started and they often provide these starter ideas like, oh, hey, well, you might consider this, or I was thinking about that. And they play this idea guy role. They become this fountain of ideas to their organization. And what, of course, they think they're doing is getting the party started, giving people some ideas to get those creative juices flowing. But what we actually find is that when the leader spouts ideas or offers ideas, people tend to do one of two things. Either they chase those ideas, they spend their time like, okay, Liz has got me doing this, so I'm gonna do this and that, or they just take those starter ideas as easy, finished ideas. And either way, what we find is that when the leaders are idea rich, people around them get idea lazy. It doesn't actually cause more creativity. It actually squelches that creativity inside of their organization. Um, a winning strategy is instead of having the leader provide a set of starter ideas, have the leader provide a set of starter questions, asking good questions. I, mean, I think this is really the critical skill, really of this decade, it might be this century, is is not for the leader to have the answers, but for the leader to ask the questions that get other people thinking, to ask more questions. Uh, sometimes some of you actually tuning in here might have taken what I call the extreme question challenge, which is to go into a meeting or conversation and, and lead it by only asking questions and being that spark of thinking rather than offering those ideas. But some questions are better than others. So the best leaders, they not only ask more questions, they ask better questions. And what I've got here is a little, what I call, it's my question value letter. It assumes that not all questions are created equal. There are some questions that are really good for getting closure. One of my favorite questions would be, are there any reasons why we shouldn't proceed? In fact, I just asked this yesterday of my research team. I'm like, imagine yourself in a movie scene, in a wedding, <laughs> and, and somebody is saying like, speak now or forever hold the peace. Like we are about to move on to a really important phase of this research. We're gonna lock in a few findings. If there's anyone on this team who feels like we are not ready to do that, please tell me now. So that's one of the questions I often use. Is there any reasons why we shouldn't proceed? Like, are there any reasons why we're like, no go for launch? Um, or we can ask more open-ended questions, questions that elicit ideas or explanations, or questions that help people find an outcome. It helps people direct people like the warmer, hotter exercise, like helping people find the action that they need to take, or guiding questions that don't assume that you as the leader know the answer. It's something that you're helping somebody else see an issue you see, a problem, an unmet need in the market, or a concern and you're just asking them to see it in the hopes that they will start to find a solution or a discovery question these are questions you don't have an answer they don't have an answer you're going to figure it out together you're going to innovate and then maybe at the very top of that ladder would be the challenge question and and i love challenge questions i i love being able to find a good challenge question and ask it i love seeing the pause when you've asked a good question as a leader and people are like, oh, well, nobody's really asked me that before. I had a wonderful colleague, uh, conversation with a colleague of mine and it ended up really, um, I think having a pivotal moment in her career. And she said, Liz, Liz, listen to me. And then finally asked, well, why, why are you assuming that? And she's like, wow, I realized I had made a bunch of assumptions and they weren't necessarily true. It's just a simple, challenge question. I love being asked these questions and I love that pause where I realize I can't draw on my pat answers. I'm like, gee, I don't know. I'm going to have to think about that. This is where we find seeds 
of innovation. Um, a quick path to asking good challenge questions is to ask yourself, what is the assumption at play here? What's the thing everybody believes to be true? Like maybe if you're a manager and people keep asking you for head count, the assumption is that more heads equate to greater productivity. We can get more done. Well, I want to challenge that assumption. I say, okay, that's the assumption we're operating under. Now let me flip that on its head. And I might ask in what way, let's say someone's come and asked for, for more head count. In, in what way is having more heads going to slow us down? Oh, I don't know. Like I was thinking that would speed us up, but okay. Yeah, it could slow us down. Like that means we have to train people. Uh, that means that we have more people communicating. It means that we are having to take our work and break it into smaller pieces. So anyway, um, ask challenge questions. Now let me give you an HR hack on this is like, I love, I'm going to go back. I love the scenario where managers take time to think about the meetings that they have that day. And they think about what are the questions I should be asking. But I realize it's a little bit of a fantasy. A lot of people just run from meeting to meeting. So maybe um, you can give yourself a hack and you can develop a set of back pocket questions. These are my back pocket questions. Uh, we, we often share these with people in the workshop, help them develop it. But I'm gonna give you a very, very quick set. So the idea of a back pocket question is a question that you literally, you could literally have on cards and keep in your back pocket, but they're really a small number of questions you hold in your head, and these are your go-to questions. So if you're in a meeting, and you know more creativity will ensue if you ask a question rather than offer an idea, you go to one of your go-to questions like, what's your view on this? Or, you know, if everyone's talking about solutions, you might ask, well, what's the fundamental job that needs to get done here? Or what's the simplest way to get this job done? I find that that actually sparks a lot of creativity. Like, wait a minute, not, not what's the most precise way? Like, what's the simplest path to success look like? Or what concerns do you have about proceeding? I mentioned that's one of my favorite questions. Or what are we assuming that might not be true? Now, if you want to create your own set of back pocket questions, the way you do this is you just kind of make a list of a bunch of questions and then you would like maybe circle the top three, you pick your faves, and then you might steal a few of my questions. And, you know, perhaps you then like make a set of index cards with a few of your favorite questions. And then you might spend a week in meetings just listening for good questions, questions your colleagues ask, questions your bosses ask. And then you might steal some of your friends' questions and make yourself a set of questions. Now, I realize very few people are going to run around with these questions in their back pocket. Does it break my heart? I realize that. But what you might do is you might just lay them all out on a table and snap, snap a photo with your phone, put it in your favorites folder. And as you're going into meetings where you want to get that in that innovation going, you might pull your back pocket questions out and say, what's the question that I should ask? Okay, that's number two. Number three, uh, a very typical innovation fail is when we ask people to rethink a solution. Like, hey, here's what we're doing today. Let's rethink that and what could we do that was different or more innovative? What we end up doing is we make things percentage points better. You know, we can improve it a little here and we, we end up sort of 10% better or 20% better. This next, this sort of winning strategy learned working for Larry Ellison at Oracle, one of the great innovators and technology minds of our time, Larry had this incredible ability to just go down the logic chain to what are the fundamental assumptions at play and to challenge those assumptions. When we challenge the assumptions upon which we have built products or services or processes inside of organizations, then we can not just incrementally improve, we can actually innovate, we can do something that's disruptive. Here's an HR hack for you. One of my favorite practices um, came from a manager who every, I don't know, quarter or so, he would pull his team together and they would make a big list of their assumptions. What is it that we are assuming to be true? These are things we never talk about. They're things that are these collective beliefs that are in the air. They write it on a piece of paper, like, um, 
maybe if I'm in an HR organization and we're responsible for our workplace policies, maybe we assume that people are more productive in the office. That's an assumption that we've been operating on. Anyway, we list all of those out. And then we step back and we prosecute them. We put them on trial and we say, do we have any evidence to support this assumption? Or is perhaps there's some evidence that refutes this or challenges this assumption. And we take some joy and pride in crossing things off that are no longer true, or maybe things that we're just going to entertain the idea that they're no longer true. And we replace old assumptions with fresh assumptions. I've seen teams do this. I've done this as a team. I've seen individuals do this, where periodically you might audit your own assumptions and see what might be causing you to be stuck in old patterns of thinking. Number four, I think a lot of us have seen the, the data that says brainstorming, while fun and while it creates a lot of new ideas, it doesn't necessarily generate a lot of innovation. What's better than brainstorming, and brainstorm being kind of like no constraints, blue sky, what should we do? The sky's the limit. We tend to be more innovative when we are solving a puzzle. So a winning strategy would be to lay out a puzzle for your team, giving them a problem that you'd like them to solve. Now, Enrique, I've got this video quote. I want you to go ahead and tee this up for us. You, you want me to what? I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you might, I know it's one of your favorite movies. Uh, do you want to describe, um, just give us a sentence or two of the plot summary of Apollo 13. It's a, an accident in space with a space uh, sh a ship that was going to the moon and it didn't, it didn't make it and, and there's a whole big deal to uh, bring the astronauts back home. Mm. And they face this problem is that this limb module is filling up with this poisonous gas, this carbon dioxide, and yeah. I want you to watch how this manager lays out this puzzle. It's kind of a famous scene from the movie. It's one of my favorites. Gene, we have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We had a CO2 filter problem on the lunar module. Five filters on the limb. Which are meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor. They're already up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15 and you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. The ones on the limb are round. So. Tell me this isn't a government operation. This just isn't a contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Rapidly. Okay, people, listen up. People upstairs handed us this one, and we got to come through. We got to find a way to make this fit into the hole for this. Using nothing but that. Let's get it organized. Okay, okay, let's build a filter. Better get some coffee going too, someone. Ah, like Enrique, I love that movie. I love this scene. He constructs this puzzle. When we have a puzzle, when we have constraints, limitations, we tend to do our best thinking. It's called like um, Jew God innovations, what they call this in India, or frugal innovation. Here's an HR hack for you. If you want to generate innovative thinking on your team, add some constraints to the request. Meaning, how do we do A with nothing but B, like how do we do A task with nothing but B resources while also maintaining this um, by this date? It's sort of an A, B, C, D constraint puzzle. It's something that I use often with my team like just yesterday it was like how do we get this book written by this date you know while also accomplishing the other commitments we've made to our clients um number five you know we often as leaders want to encourage risk-taking uh, innovation by fiat you know take risks try encourage it actually doesn't help people be more innovative what gives people a chance to really innovate is where you carve out a space for mistakes. So instead of telling people, you know, take risks, fail, learn, recover, be honest with yourself and them saying, you know what, there are parts of the business that we can't take those kind of risks. These are like freeways. It's dangerous to go out and play in this space. We've got to lock it down, do it right. 
but over here, these are our playgrounds. These parts of our operation, our business, these projects, these are the ones where we can innovate, where we can take risks, we can learn, and we can recover. Okay, that's my timer telling me we are just at the end of our time. The last that I would offer is kind of a fundamental idea is what fails at generating innovation is when leaders tell people what to do. A better role for the leader is to articulate the job to be done. And maybe that's in honor of Clayton Christensen who passed recently, who really expanded this thinking about innovation comes when we really get down to what fundamentally are we trying to accomplish? What is the need we're trying to meet? What is the job to be done? And maybe a simple HR hack is to create what I call a statement of work for people who work for you. Describe for them the three what's. Number one, when, when giving someone a challenge or a task, just tell them what good looks like. Hey, this is what success looks like. Number two, what is what does done look like? Here's how we know when we've crossed the finish line on this. And three, here's what's out of scope. Focus your energy there. Um, there's a few HR hacks that you can use as a leader or an HR professional to generate more innovation, more ideas, more creativity. I think I would sum it up in saying that I certainly find that when a leader tells less and asks more, more often asks better questions, they get more from people, more thinking, more energy, more creativity, more innovation, and work becomes a whole lot more fun as well. Enrique, thank you for inviting me. Thanks for joining Enrique and me and others um, in the Hacking HR Summit. Thank you.